Welcome to the Final History of University Life Seminar for 2020. My name is Julia Horn and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Sydney, as well as co-convener of this series, The History of University Life with Matthew Thomas and Derek Schroeder. First and of course foremost, I wish to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we broadcast today and pay respect to Gadigal elders past, present and future because of course it's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. So as we share our own knowledge and research practices today, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. And since today's discussion is about archiving the present for the future, May we also remember the long time injustices towards Indigenous peoples in Australia and around the world for ignoring, taking and often destroying their distinctive historical records that can be said to constitute their cultural memory. So today's seminar is about archiving crises, double entendre possibly intended, where we explore how archival and cultural collections can help make sense of life in COVID times. We'll be treated to a sneak preview of four special COVID projects, three of which deal specifically with university life. We'll briefly go back in time to the last virulent global viral pandemic, the 1919 Spanish flu, and we also have a special mystery panellist. We have four guests on our panel today, First is Nairi Morrison, who's Senior Archivist at the University of Sydney Archives and co-director of Beyond 1914, which is a digital archive and biographical project and which is about to have a offspring called Beyond 1939, which will be established in the next year. It's worth noting also, of course, that the university archives are responsible for the care and preservation of university records of permanent value. Next will be Jennifer Stanton, who's the Manager of Digital Collections at the University Library. And Jen and her team look after the Digital Collections Repository with the aim to increase digital access to university research and the library's rare and special collections for now and the future. Then I'll interview our mystery guest, Christian Marijanovic, a first year student majoring in History and Political Economy. He's one of the history student representatives, along with Bella Bow, creating a special questionnaire and interview based archive called Not Your Average Survey, a student-led COVID-19 archive. And finally, Richard Neville, who is Mitchell Librarian and Director of Engagement at the State Library of New South Wales. Richard has published widely on and curated many exhibitions about 19th century Australian art and society and is extensively involved in acquisition, arrangement, description and promotion of the Mitchell Library's renowned Australian research collections, including, of course, their new COVID collection. So today we talk about collections. As with all collecting ventures, the act of collecting is itself political in the sense of what is collected, what's not collected, what's made available, what isn't, how communities gain access to the archives, or of course, how they might be excluded from them. All our speakers are acutely aware of these push-pull factors in creating collections and making them widely available in the digital age. As we shall hear, a particular challenge is ensuring the diversity of experience and how some communities are more represented than others. So we would like you to participate in this discussion and offer your ideas of how to reach unrepresented communities and have them document in whichever way they wish their life during COVID. So during the course of this webinar, please use the chat function located on the right of your screen to jot down your ideas and we'll use these to further the discussion in coming months. So, of course, there's much to get through within the next 55 minutes or so. As usual, we'll begin with the presentations with the final 10 minutes or so devoted to questions. So a reminder to use the chat function during, during this webinar to jot down your uh, COVID collection ideas and thoughts and the Q&A function for any questions you might have. Now to our speakers. First, we have 
Nairi Morrison, Senior Archivist at the University of Sydney, who will speak on pandemic collections, past and present. Thanks, Julia. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Um, I'd just like to start this presentation by uh, reading a poem um, that's come from the Sydney Medical Journal, That Flu Feeling. A microscope has been stolen from the medical school. News item. I had all the symptoms, I knew them by heart, a pain at the rear of my head, in my back, in my limbs and in every damn part, and my eyes felt as heavy as lead. I felt terribly crook, I had rigors galore, and my temperature rose to 104. Yes, it looked like the flu, but alas, it was more, for the magistrate said, as his eyes pierced me through, for pinching that mic, six months hard you will do. So I had all the symptoms, but minus the flu. I just wanted to put that there just in case anybody was very lucky not to experience uh, those flu symptoms so you could get an idea of how bad they were. Um, I do realise that there has actually been quite a lot of press uh, recently regarding the 1919 flu pandemic, but I thought it would be very useful to have some basic statistics on the pandemic to put into context the university's response. Can I have the next slide, please? So on the 25th of October 1918, a ship arrives in Sydney from New Zealand with infected passengers on board and all are confined at North Head Quarantine Station. On the 27th of January 1919, New South Wales officially confirms that there is a flu outbreak and Victoria confirms their outbreak the next day. From January to September 1919, 6,387 people have died from the flu in New South Wales and there's some 290,000 people infected in metropolitan Sydney alone. By the end of 1919, the pandemic is over. The estimated death toll in Australia is over 15,000 people, with 40% of the population infected, with some indigenous communities recording a mortality of 50%. And on a global scale, flu has infected a quarter of the world's population, killing between 50 to 100 million people. So what exactly was the university's response to the flu pandemic? Can I have the next slide, please? So this is from the uh, university's uh, Senate annual report, and it just basically outlines the effect this uh, flu had on the academic year. Um, because of the crowded conditions in the classroom, the government authorities um, mandated that masks had to be um, worn and also that um, the university was closed for five weeks in the early part of the year. Um, the time was partially made up by curtailing the June and September vacations, by rearranging the work of the second and third terms and beholding the annual examinations I am a week later than usual. So not much difference to what the university has sort of issued for um, the semesters this year. On April the 1st, 1919, the professorial board adopts a number of emergency measures to attempt to restrict flu on campus. And these include um, all students wearing masks within classrooms. Um, no person should attend the university if they have a temperature of over 99 degrees. Um, and if they do have an attack, then they have to stay home um, until the temperature comes down for three consecutive days. Um, all members of the university have to submit to re-inoculation and anyone who has um, an attack of the flu, even if it's a mild attack, they have to stay at home until they're cleared to come back on campus by um, a doctor. Um, the interesting um, thing is, is that um, the statement at the end of that there, which says these recommendations assume that every member of the university not only wishes to escape the infection, but is no less anxious to avoid being the medium by which a possibly fatal infection is conveyed to other members. Again, just it's the same message that we're hearing uh, currently. So the professorial board continued with the precautionary measures until July, when the wearing of masks in crowded classrooms is withdrawn. So this next picture is of a uh, Dr. Colley Madsen, who was a third year medical student in 1919. Um, and he volunteered in one of the temporary hospitals that was set up um, to look after um, patients who had caught the flu. Um, there were only 2,000 hospital beds in New South Wales at the start of the pandemic. And between January and September, 25,000 people in New South Wales were admitted to hospital with the flu. And obviously the flu took its toll on those frontline healthcare workers. And you can see uh, Collie Madden here in the 1919 equivalent of full PPE. Um, and this is uh, a picture of him here in the corner without wearing the mask. So we're very lucky to have an oral history transcript 
of um, Collie Madden's time um, volunteering. To make my third year harder came the terrible plague or pneumonic influenza. Emergency hospitals were established throughout Sydney and in various parts of the country. At the Sydney showground and the deaf, dumb and blind institution and special health regulations and quarantine rules were proclaimed, even quarantine between different states between Queensland and New South Wales. We students were in it too. I was now in third year, only just in, for this was April 1919 and we all volunteered to help. It was first contact with sickness and I had had no clinical training, but I was able to look like a young doctor and dole out the stock medicines and the instructions I was handed. Perhaps I doled out a little confidence to the poor people too. Now, as well as the war um, having an impact on um, social activities um, at the university due to so many of the university community being um, at the front, um, the flu actually had um, an impact on student activities on campus as well with um, events curtailing. I did have a look through the various uh, student records, uh, student club society records that the archives hold, but surprisingly not many of them actually say anything um, about the flu. So as you can see, the archives don't actually have that much uh, records um, reflecting what was happening on campus at the time. Now regarding COVID-19, the university archives are ensuring that the core business records of the university are captured. Um, this will preserve the decisions made and the university response to the pandemic um, will be retained in perpetuity. So we've been speaking to the staff who've been taking um, the records for the pandemic response team and the crisis management team and ensuring that the staff emails that have been sent from the vice chancellor with updates um, have been captured. Archive staff have been on campus um, in the odd day between um, May and June and just some of the photographs that you're seeing here um, we took um, and you can see just see how desolate the campus looks um, at the time. These notice boards are usually full of um, notices for events and you know just get togethers, debates, that sort of thing and they're, um, they're empty because nothing was happening. Um, and on the next slide, um, which is actually my favourite, that's the notice on the Great Hall door, basically saying that graduations have been cancelled until further notice. So, thank you. Thank you, Nairi. I have a follow-up question, which um, actually just pursues that notion of digitisation. Um, digitisation, of course, changes the nature of the archives, and that's a huge topic, and I don't expect you to address or answer that right now, but I did wonder if you could explain just some aspects of going digital which either excite or worry you. Uh, exciting is the availability of a much wider audience to access the archives, um, and just the engagement with communities. They can add tags, they can um, add content, they can suggest different spelling, they can identify people, but the availability is only uh, there for people who actually have access to technology. So coming back to your point of a uh, disadvantage to communities or people who are in remote areas who don't have access to that technology, then they won't have access to the digital archive. The thing that worries me is people seem to think that if you digitise the archive then you can just throw the original archive out um, and you can't do that. As we know, paper will last a lot longer than the digital um, image that we have. So how are we um, going to preserve not only the original format but that digital surrogate that we have? Um, so people don't really seem to think about that. The one thing that I think I should have to emphasise is digitising is not just simply putting something through a scanner, it's actually quite a labour intensive exercise and it actually takes um, up quite a bit of money as well. So it's not just as simple as just sitting something in front of a scanner, press and start and that's it. Um, you know, as the archivist we have to take things off the shelf, you have to prepare them, you have to make sure that um, they're actually in a condition that can be digitised. 
we don't have at the university archives the facilities to digitise on site, so we have to send them off site. You have to make sure that when they come back, they're in the same condition in which you sent them out on. So it is actually quite labour intensive, and then it's preparing to put it on the internet because you can't just put it there and have it free floating. You actually have to provide context for it. So, as much as it is exciting, it's actually quite a lot of work to do that. Thank you, Nairi. Next we have Jennifer Stanton, who's Manager of Digital Collections here at the University of Sydney in the University Library, and who's also with her team working on the University of Sydney COVID-19 Cultural Collection. So over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Julia. Uh, so while I was studying for my history degree at university, I would trawl through boxes of primary sources at the Kayama Family History Centre. One particular thing I remember is going through pages and pages of documents about the creation of the Kayama War Memorial. These sources added richness to my work and gave me a more solid understanding and appreciation of what was happening at the time. Personally, I'm grateful for the collecting that has been done in the past for what it allows us to know and learn from in the current day. In April this year, not too long after we were told to work from home, it began to be very clear that we had the opportunity to collect university history about a time period that would undoubtedly be researched, discussed and tweeted about from now and for a long time into the future. We began to plan for collecting COVID-19. It was by no means my idea. I had seen this be discussed in various forums and implemented by the State Library of New South Wales and Cambridge University but I was in a position to be able to do something about it at the University of Sydney. Thankfully, my managers agreed and the library launched the Collecting COVID-19 project in May. So through Collecting COVID-19, we're asking for help from university staff and students to collect content relating to COVID-19 and the University of Sydney. We'd like this to be used for future research, teaching and for public interest. We want to preserve and make accessible meaningful information that will depict how the University of Sydney community was impacted collectively and individually. The University of Sydney is a diverse community and the COVID-19 pandemic has had a varying impact on each of us. Collecting our stories, photos, artworks and recordings will document what happened. It will help us learn about the impact of processes and policies and the actions that were taken. I hope it will also reflect the resilience of us as individuals and as a community. We have a variety of items submitted to the collection so far and I would love to share some of these with you. First slide, please. I really like the idea of notice board bark, which is obviously a popular one. Um, this was submitted by Samaya Langley and the usually full notice boards have been stripped back to stubs of paper. Next slide. Photos submitted also show the different signage that has popped up around campus. Depending on when the photos were taken, you can watch the strengthening and then easing of COVID-19 restrictions through these images. Now, one of the hardest items to get into the collection, but something I've been particularly keen on collecting, are personal reflections. Having a person document how something happened or how they felt during this time is incredibly meaningful. And trying to capture this in a few years' time will wear away the authenticity of the situation. One of the biggest barriers is that people don't think that their story is worth telling or they think it's insignificant. However, this really isn't true. All stories about the impact of COVID-19 are worth capturing to show how it changed our, changed our lives for a short or long period, and there really is no right or wrong answer. To push what might be a hard sell, I've personally found it quite cathartic to take some time to reflect on what has happened and how far we've come since the start of the pandemic. Next slide. Professor Jane Hammerham from Sydney Pharmacy School donated a reflection of the Faculty of Medicine and Health student-led interprofessional influenza vaccination clinic, which details the necessity and success of the clinic, but also the difficulties of doing so during a pandemic. In Jane's reflection, she observed that, we were a little short on hand sanitizer, which by this time was pretty much unavailable across the country. However, our secret sash, stash of hand sanitizer, it was almost worth more than gold at this point, left over from the vaccination training course, was supplemented with some World Health Organization recipe hand sanitizer. The Who Home Brew hand sanitizer was kindly donated by School of Pharmacy professional officer Chris Hick, who had developed a side hustle making it for many schools in FMH. Next slide. 
Cheyenne Quinlan donated a reflection about being a PhD student, mother and woman in academia during COVID-19. In her reflection, Cheyenne writes, Zoom became a verb, meeting after meeting online, hellish for many, but for the previously isolated students like me, a balm to long isolation and loneliness. This drove me to look for the same for others. I pushed to and relaunched the HDRP mentor program faculty wide. In two weeks, nearly 90 fellow HDR students have signed up, all reaching out for support, connection and relevance, many of whom are women. We are needing each other. Next slide, please. The now university librarian, Philip Kent, details what it was like to move from the UK, where he was university librarian at Bristol, to Sydney to take up his new role during the pandemic. Philip wrote, Early on the morning of Friday 27th of March 2020, a car took me to London Heathrow in order to catch the final, the final Qantas flight to Australia. The potency of the situation was affirmed when my driver told me that their well-known transfer service was closing and I was his last job for the foreseeable future. Heathrow was unlike the bustling, fun and buoyant environment I have known so well. It was sombre. People were trying to find distant seats and limited food and to quell the crying children. I think these examples demonstrate just how powerful personal reflections are in capturing our experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have also had some do donations of creative works and it's really been an absolute honour to accept these items into the collection. Olivia Oliver Hopkins, a final year master's student, was encouraged by her teacher to share with her class how she felt through the pandemic, which she did so in a poem. Olivia wrote, there's a certain order in pruning newly discovered that I love. Perhaps it's the ability to control nature while outside it controls me. I may be stuck here in my garden, but it's my garden and I'll make it look how I like. So I pruned the lily pillies walking in a line almost marching, ruthlessly clipping any leaf out of place, enjoying the sharp snip of the secateurs as they flash in the late afternoon sun. Next slide, please. Finally, we've had some lovely donations about University of Sydney pet life during COVID-19. This example shows Jenny Crosby's dog, Lois Lane, very responsibly distancing herself while on campus during the pandemic. Well done, Lois. Um, now, while we have had some wonderful donations so far, we would love to have a lot more from anyone who is part of the university. At the moment, the collection is really missing the voice of students and teaching staff. We are hoping to have some time to do active collecting in order to build up a collection that truly tells the story of the University of Sydney during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next year, we will start to curate the collection to make it available to the public later in 2021. Next slide, please. Now, if you have anything that you would like to submit to the collection, you can head to the Collecting COVID-19 Project website and submit directly to our digital, digital collections repository. Alternatively, you can get in, in touch with us via email. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, very much for that. And uh, those, those URLs will be repeated at the end of, um, of our session today. So don't despair. So now our mystery guest, and I just say mystery because of course um, you thought that we only had three panellists on this session. So our mystery guest is Christian Marijanovic, who's a first year student who found himself along with Bella Bau from um, the History Department student um, representative group to be part of a collecting team, I think it is, which um, has collected both questionnaires and interviews and which is going to head to Jen's collection. Um, so you will soon be getting actually, Jen, some, some uh, recollections of student as well as staff life. So welcome, Christian. I'm really delighted that um, you're brave enough to front up to, <laughs> with us today. <laughs> so your project with Bella and a couple of other volunteers, um, you've cleverly called not Your Average Survey, a student-led COVID-19 archive. And it constitutes over 130 in-depth questionnaires and about 10 hours of interview. So I wondered if you could, first of all, provide some quick stats perhaps on who responded, you know, the demographics as it were of the group. Yeah, sure. So um, we had um, about three quarters of um, respondents that were female, um, other 22% male. Um, from the different like faculties and departments, we had um, 
so 45% were from the um, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences from FAS, and about 30% really not applicable, they were just staff members. 40% of all respondents we got, the 139 were students. Nine, only 9% 9 of those were international though, only 18% of those were part-time students, 77% were non-honours students, and 73% more undergraduate. But although we had a lot of those, the problem with that though was that a lot of them really provided relatively short responses. Um, also of total response, apart from students, we had 47% of response were non-academic staff and another 12% were academic. Okay, so the survey, which in fact I filled out, I must say, <laughs> I must admit, being a member of the Department of History, it covered a real range of issues and, you know, it was really trying to dig deep into people's, um, to get them to really respond as much as they wanted to um, about their experience during the time. So I did wonder whether you could just tell us, you know, what, did you think there were some questions in the survey that you thought were really, really important to ask? Yeah, we try to get like open-ended the questions, you know, make them more optional, like so people could really put whatever they felt like was most important about their like, I suppose their experience with COVID, like this year really. So, you know, one of the main questions which we were like the longer responses for was, how would you describe the way this pandemic has reshaped your life? Pretty simple, pretty open-ended. And, you know, like there's like an earlier draft we had for it was like, what is your experience of self-isolation, both currently at the peak of restrictions, you know, and we, you know, we had like a whole list of like different things to fill in and that, but, you know, we thought that would be a bit tedious, put people off the survey, but it shows that really we wanted a broad range of things covered. And what we end up settling with for this specific question, got us like, we got all sorts of um, areas covered, like things like, you know, online interactions, maybe like friends, it, you know, students, you know, learning, uh, hygiene, um, appreciation for things I took for granted, family. Um, and, you know, there was one, per, you know, a few people mentioned like, you know, church services and that. So lots of things that got changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you give us a couple of examples of your favourite responses to the questionnaire? Sure. So one, of, so one of the things they answered on was on Sydney Uni's response to the, to COVID. And as you know, most of them were like, thought it was, you know, fairly competent or whatever. So one international student from like Denmark, a FAST student said, um, UC had a good response. My home universe, university at the time, Northeastern, from which I now transferred into UC, had a terrible in comparison response. You know, some though were a bit more critical. There was this one FAST student who said, will provide cover for the overpaid management of Sydney University to increase the oleization of degrees. There, you know, and we didn't just want like uni related stuff. So, you know, we asked like people's non uni related personal stuff. So for instance, like just with lockdown, you know, a lot of people experience like negatively, right? You know, this was one of the funnier ones from an honours student. She said, she wrote that, while my mum used all the stimulus money to pay for moving expenses, my brother had bought seven plus Louis Vuittons with purely the money of the stimuli. I frankly am frustrated constantly because my brother, the microbiologist, ignores COVID. He's had five plus people sleep over before and he's gone out clubbing. And you know, some, you know, um, not as funny, um, but you know, more positive you know, experience of, I suppose, COVID lockdown was, you know, apart from seeing physical contact with colleagues, the work experience has been almost exactly the same as it would be in person. Yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting. Um, now, as I said, you have about 10 hours of interviews. So um, I wonder if you could perhaps end with one of the responses that you found really interesting. Mm, sure, so out, the, out of the, um, one of the interviews we, with the interviews we really try to like expand on some of the survey things because you know they were relatively short, you know, what they put for some responses. So, you know, this one academic staff from one of the um, members from one of the clinical schools, you know, she just wrote about her, how her church adjusted to COVID. And you know, she wrote quite, you know, was a bit brief with the survey. She wrote that, you know, we are part of a local church community and had to change to meeting by Zoom on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings, Bible study. Some older members found the technology challenging and she wrote church by Zoom in like another question. But in the interview, she expanded a bit on that. So this is part of that. So it's our local church at Beecroft. It's called Beecroft Presbyterian Church. It's just an ordinary church there, but we've been active members since we've lived in Beecroft and we're actually involved in that. We've both been very involved in church leadership roles there. The church went to having Zoom services and that was quite a lot of work. You couldn't all do singing together, so what they did is have a pre-recorded hymn. The good quality ones around, so I'll be singing at home. I'm normally one of the lead singers, because I like singing. Music's one of my things, so it's been really hard. So when you're at home, you can sing, but when you're there in person, 
So you know what I do? I do percussion with my feet, with my hands, and I hum, and I feel frustrated. It's really funny. And I have an older friend who's a really amazing musician. And it's really important for her faith to be able to express herself through music and through singing. She was actually a chaplain for many years, and she used to sing to people as part of a chaplaincy, and she does it beautifully, and she can't do that, and that's really hard for her. I think that's an interesting thing to try to capture. How did place of worship, how, how they have adapted our cultural expressions of who we are and of our faith, and how we do things have changed dramatically. I personally believe that our faith, faith expressions are really important to who we are as human beings. You know, and that sort of stuff like, you couldn't get that same depth of just like a survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a wonderful project and congratulations to you both. Um, so thank you. So finally, we have Richard Neville, Mitchell Librarian at the State Library of New South Wales, who will speak on the State Library of New South Wales COVID-19 Collecting Drive. So over to Richard. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Neville and I am the Mitchell Librarian at the State Library of New South Wales. And today I'm going to be outlining how the library has approached the collecting of COVID-19. Clearly libraries such as our state libraries and indeed the National Library are the main repositories of the documentary history and heritage of this country. And when, uh, you know, we, the State Library of New South Wales, for instance, has been doing this really since the 1880s, I think now perhaps in a more sophisticated way than we did at the outset, the library's initial collection focus was very much the description of the Anglo-European history of Australia. Probably since the 1960s and 70s, we have tried to ensure that we collect the diversity of Australian experience along with and in partnership with our fellow state libraries and the National Library. When COVID struck in, uh, in early 2020, so two things informed our approaches. Firstly, we understood from work we had done last year on uh, the commemoration of the Spanish flu, that while the archives for that particular event were very rich in governmental records, there were very few records that had survived around people's personal experiences. So really right from the get-go, this library locked down on March the 23rd, all the state libraries came together and with the National Library to talk about how we were going to approach the documentation of this particular crisis. Uh, initially it was decided to take a kind of citizen collecting approach, so we all asked our readers to contribute ephemera that they may have found in their letterboxes or have been seen around their shops and so on, to bring that into the library. Uh, we, uh, in to contribute to their library collections. We initiated two online projects. The first, which went up very quickly in early April, was an Instagram feed called New South Wales at Home. The idea behind that was that people could uh, take photos of their new circumstances. So obviously, the um, so kitchen table became the new workspace, etc., and they could contribute those photos with the hashtag New South Wales at Home and the library pledged to ensure that this archive would be maintained forevermore. The second thing we initiated was a project called the Diary Files, and the idea behind the Diary Files, which was developed by the library's own TX Lab, was that it was a kind of online platform where people could write up to 300 word entries, like putting it into their own, into a sort of like an electronic journal, and you could contribute as many entries as you liked. Um, a lot of people, in a lot of school children obviously set tasks by their teachers to write diary entries and that was a very interesting perspective from children. Uh, one young man from Putland who was in the Cobham Correctional Centre was very concerned that he would struggle to get out of the centre if he had to appear before a magistrate online. He thought he had a much better chance if he could appear before him in person. Um, but a lot of the entries were in, to a certain extent, kind of slightly positive in the sense that people were saying, oh, you know, it's been an opportunity to wind down, to step back from the busy life, get off the treadmill, etc." So I think, you know, some respects that pointed to the sort of methodological flaw behind these kind of citizen collecting projects in that really only interested people, people who have access to technology and people who can write and contribute in English, um, um, participate in these processes. So we, um, we will certainly be looking, and it was, a, it was a way of capturing very immediate responses, but it's by no means the end of the collecting process. Um, very early on, uh, Wendy Sharp, who's a very well-known Australian artist, approached us with her uh, Corona Diary, 
Uh, it's a concertina diary about five meters long. And that was her way of trying to respond to the psychological impact of lockdown. And a lot of these projects got a lot of traction at the very beginning of lockdown. And I suppose we've seen a, a tailing off of interest as, as restrictions have been gradually eased. But we didn't, you know, her diary is not a literal representation of what was happening, but it does, it is a document of an emotional and a kind of intellectual response to the virus. The most obvious form of documentation for the virus has, of course, been photography. Uh, we have uh, been approached by photographers like John Jansen Moore, uh, Dean Saffron, Tom Williams, to, uh, who have recorded the kind of familiar images that we now know of deserted streets, uh, testing clinics, uh, places shut down, uh, and so on. So, I mean, that has been a very important part of what we are doing. A lot of what we have thus far has been focused very much on uh, Sydney, and we obviously need to ensure that our representation moves beyond Sydney into the more broader, in, in, across New South Wales. I mean, interestingly, photography, uh, we just initiated at the end of December and into January a, a major project to document Australia, the bushfires that had struck us and that devastated New South Wales and Victoria over the summer. Uh, we've kind of had to put that on hold a bit while we've approached the COVID, the dealt with COVID. But I think in the longer term, uh, what we see as we contribute, as, as the state libraries around the country contribute, uh, we are beginning to build a quite um, we're the foundation of a rich picture of what COVID means. Uh, we, the National Library, importantly, takes six week snapshots of the .au web domain. So throughout the throughout the pandemic, we will have a, 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 a kind of slice of time every six weeks of how the web has responded to um, the pandemic. We do collect social media uh, tweets. So we have a system called Visi, which is a CSIRO product enables us to collect social media around the uh, pandemic. But I think what we would say is that we're at the foundation, we're at the beginning, we're by no means at the end of the process. We have to be very clear about the importance of us um, engaging uh, with the diverse communities. We don't really as yet have much evidence of people who've lost their jobs, of, our communities outside Sydney particularly. We don't yet have evidence of uh, culturally and diverse communities who wouldn't normally interact with us. Um, we really, uh, and we, so I think in the longer term that will be an area we are aiming at dealing with and ensuring that we record. Um, COVID also is something that's going to be with us. The impact will be with us for decades, presumably for and so we will continue to keep an eye on it as a very important stream of our many strands of collecting. Uh, we certainly don't see this as being the, the end of the process as we move towards the end of the pandemic if all these vaccines and so on kick in. Uh, the impact will be, there'll be a long tail to this and we think um, our ability to uh, ensure that we continue to address the questions um, that the pandemic raises is important. We say what we, our collecting, we're very keen that our collecting um, be useful. The kind of mantra or our kind of assessment tool is to say, well, what will the researcher make of this in 100 years' time? Um, and that's the kind of time frame we're working in. When we take something into our collection, we're taking it in permanently, forever. And so we do, um, collecting is a cost, everything we acquire, we have to then continue to pay for. So we make some pretty hard decisions around these, but I think we understand, that we as the State Library, but also I think all our colleagues around the nation, that this process is by no means finished and that we uh, will be forever looking at new ways to uh, understand the impact of the pandemic and record its, um, its impact across the diversity of our communities. And um, for us, that's a, a kind of key mandate um, so thank you. So thank you very much, Richard. And we'll now welcome you back because you did mention the diary files. And I wondered if you could give us a couple of examples, if you had some to read out. Yes, um, the diary files was a very popular, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. And people 
I mean, you've been talking about trying to get uh, people's reflections of their experiences. And so that's what it was interesting for. So, for instance, Linda, who lived in Bonnie Hills, writes, my family and I live in a beautiful seaside village named Bonnie Hills on the New South Wales mid North Coast. Sounds idyllic. Well, yes, it was until COVID-19 hit our community. I had a contract job working for TAFE in Port Macquarie and had been doing this for the past eight months. My 10 week contract was meant to be renewed at the end of March, COVID took my job away. I applied for a job seeker and was fortunate to get that, including the extra $550 COVID payment. It kept our finances afloat, but we ended up dipping into our savings just to pay for the basics. Ending work gave me plenty of time. I was able to walk, jog, run on the beach every day with my dog. Friend and acquaintances would stop to chat, but we all stayed apart by at least 1.5 metres. It felt weird and life was pretty boring as we just stayed at home, went walking or went to Woolies to buy food. And I think that was a kind of fairly typical reflection of many people, the sense that they were pulling back from uh, life as it was, but also sort of trying to embrace uh, some of the, trying to embrace the positives. And I suppose that's also the point that in these diary files, we don't get many people whose circumstances were really challenged. But um, another one, which was really, we, uh, a teacher at the Cobham Correctional Centre had her students who are actually um, not very, you know, they were young students in, uh, in effectively in jail. Um, and so she used this as an exercise to have them write and the kind of the uh, incentive to the, to the little challenge was that they're going to have their reflections published in the diary files. So and they're all young teenagers. So uh, Putman student L, obviously these are anonymous, uh, said, I'm a 15 year old boy and I am in lock up in lockdown. I've been trying to show my family how to use this Zoom app, but my family are too old to use the app. Because we're not allowed to visit, uh, we're not allowed visits or can't even see my friends or brothers or sisters. You can't even get toilet paper in, uh, nowhere. You have to wait till they restock. I can't go to court because of COVID-19. I think I have a better chance of getting out while I'm in front of the judge. When I was in my room, I was, uh, put all of, I was put all of my items in my pillowcase and work on my arms. When I'm in lockdown, I have been thinking about my family and mates. So, um, you know, it's a kind of, they're the kinds of reflections I think that, I mean, everyone is quite keen to see. And uh, I've, one of your comments uh, was talking about the diversity, you know, sort of, are we getting gay and lesbian, indigenous? Um, so obviously uh, people in lockdown or in jails and so on, we just, the idea behind a state library is the breadth of the collecting and the uh, kind of, they're trying to address an entire community. So uh, Diary Files is one way of trying to do that, I suppose. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, really evocative. Um, two very evocative pieces there. So thank you for sharing those. Uh, so we now move to the final part of the session. Please do keep jotting down your thoughts about the collecting process, which we'll be gathering together and working on over the next few months. Um, particularly about the need for diversity, about the positive and negatives of digital collections, these sorts of questions are all really important. If you want to actually ask a question, use the Q&A button. Um, so I would like to start the ball rolling by asking everyone who's assembled to my left and also on the screen, Richard, um, and to ask you a question, if we can just focus on this notion of diversity, and the challenges of only relying on what Richard called citizen collecting to build collections. There is a need, as I think you all noted, to ensure that these collections capture experiences from a wide range of people and communities. So at this early stage of the collecting process, are there communities you would specifically like to target which may otherwise go unnoticed and unrecorded and I suppose I'd like to extend that by asking, is this where our, our collecting institutions should become archival activists? That's a word that's gained a bit of currency over the last decade or so. And how do you do this? So perhaps, um, Jen, since I didn't give you a follow-up question before, perhaps you could answer that, um, are you thinking there are particular communities within the university who you, now want to go out and 
you know, get some of their stories and how much you encourage them? Yes, so absolutely. Um, in terms of sort of categories within the university, um, as I mentioned before, looking at undergraduate students and looking at teaching staff and hopefully to capture some of their experiences. But if we're going for more cultural diversity, um, I mean, I would love to have um, entries and different perspectives from every different culture at the university if possible. And I think um, one particular way of targeting that would be to go to international students. Um, I think one of the difficulties uh, in my role and where I am, where I'm not, um, I'm not student or even staff facing really, it's trying to find the right ways to approach and trying to find the right communication channels for that. Um, so absolutely we want to go out and um, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get some submissions from some First Nations people as well. Um, one of the things I was thinking about and uh, thinking about this in relation to the importance of how you set up collections is that if you are looking to get a diverse collection, the importance of making sure you don't make decisions like uh, we only take submissions in English and to try and make your collection as welcoming as possible and that you're going to take care of that collection and manage things responsibly. So yes, we are hoping to go out and um, get a lot more things from a really diverse community. Um, it's just a matter of working out how to, how to reach everyone to give them that opportunity. So Nairi, I wondered if, since your obviously university archives is a little bit different in that you're not going out collecting, you rely on people, on departments often to give you the records, but is there something here where you think there does need to be a bit of the activist archivist um, in collecting things which you might not otherwise have got through ordinary uh, modes of deposit? Um, yeah, I think I have to agree with Jane here um, and just trying to get especially the international um, students just hearing that voice because that's missing from the archive at the minute. Um, that student experience and just, yeah, how do you encourage people? And what Richard was saying earlier as well, at the beginning people are interested in doing that and then it sort of tails off. But how is the pandemic affecting everybody in the long term? So. Um, I, I, I don't know, it's like a collaborative approach between the archives and the library and how we can encourage people and how you maintain that enthusiasm and it doesn't tail off, but encourage them to participate in what they've collected and um, to share it in such a way, just what I was saying earlier, the excitement and how can you get people to collaborate? How would, we, how would they want to share their experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Richard, did you want to add to that? I mean, I think, you know, there's often a sense that we have to do it all now and we have to resolve these kinds of questions now. And often, you know, with the Gay and Lesbian Archives, for instance, which we began to collect, it's kind of big time in the 1990s. Um, they took ages to develop and to form into really substantial collections. And now we've got a great little exhibition on about coming out in the 1970s. And that was built on just really decades of collecting. So um, I think this sense that, you know, there are individual, there are individual responses, but there are also organisational responses. So there will be um, committee, uh, you know, organisations who are looking after homeless people or looking after First Nations people. And those kind of organisational archives are really important too. So it's not only the personal voice, it's actually the, the, the sort of the range of people who are dealing with both personally and organisationally that we need to be looking at. And I, you know, we try to be an activist in one sense. Um, it's a bit hard for sort of, you know, people who obviously sometimes see us as kind of politically First Nations people, we see us as a very colonial organisation, we just have to look at our, our shop front, which is the porticos of the Mitchell Library, it's a pretty intimidating kind of space. So we've got work to do there, but we do try and get into spaces where we feel we're going to make connections. With it. But nor you can't force it either. It's often an organic and it's based on trust and relationships. And so, you know, it's often, it's, it's a time. Yeah, thank you, thank you. There are a couple of comments that I'll draw people's attention to which I've been sent. So one uh, says, I think it would be interesting to collect what people think may be different about the future, which 
COVID changes will persist, persist or which mightn't be. So, uh, and how will changes affect our trajectory long term? Um, it's a particularly potent question, I think, given universities have in some way this year been under so much attack. So um, there's one suggestion. Um, and there's another request, uh, which is, you know, is it possible to collect portraits of people in their work from home, in their work from home spaces? What's the new acronym? WFH, isn't it? Which I always confuse with the other one. <laughs> WT, whatever it is, anyway. Um, so ideally surrounded by piles of laundry. Um, I mean, in my case, um, I ended up be, you know, working at the kitchen table and actually in the end wrote a letter to my head of school saying, could I please come into my office so I can actually get some work done because I've got such a sore neck <laughs> and there's so much noise here from others working at home. Um, so in other words, photos from moments in history fascinate uh, the writer of this comment and convey so much without actually needing words. So I think that's a comment to keep the photographic archive um, up. So um, the other thing I wanted to really ask is that of course much of the COVID archive you are all creating is with the possible exception of Nairi in the future is digital. And I wondered if we could all perhaps just reflect briefly um, does this mean that the physical archive, that COVID is going to be one of these um, moments in history where the physical archive no longer has relevance? Um, or is, there, is the physical archive still really vital in historical memory? So I just thought I might uh, you know, start with you, Christian, to, since you're a user of the digital archive, and you certainly were in first semester when you had no access to any libraries, they were all shut. So perhaps you might just reflect briefly on your experience of that and what you would tell, you have here assembled experts in the field, so give them some advice sure. from a user's um, point of view. So, see, I'm only like a first year student, so I don't have, you know, history since I, want, I don't have too much experience with the archives that, but. Because one of these, um, one of the units I picked up was a history workshop, and you know, if you look through like um, a certain like topic like intensively, um, and you know what the one I ended up doing was like um, the shanty towns in like the Great Depression in La Perouse, right in Sydney, and you know for that I remember there was this one stack, well a virtual stack, but like of like two hundred and like sixty or something like photos of like different documents from it, and which was I remember going through them. It was a bit of a, I'm not sure if it was a pain because it was just you know, lots of boring government documents or because it was digital, but digital was definitely part of it. So, you know, this whole like idea that like archives can be solely digital, like I, I kind of saw it as well because with, um, I, I read some time ago that Obama's um, presidential um, center is not actually like a presidential library, like the old ones, they have all the, you know, archives there on site, you know, it's going to be all digital. It was like, kind of style like, you know, for like the first digital president or something like that. And I kind of see it as that, you know, with with archives, with like, part of it is preference, but like, you know, part of it is practical as well. Like, um, you know, why, you know, it is, there is actually difficulty in digitizing things and that, but you know, it's not just preference for why people prefer, say, physical archives, say, but like, I feel like part of it as well is just like, kind of like, there's, there's value as well in like presenting the actual thing. It's like, you know, same to a museum or that. Same, yeah, same to a museum or that. So there, there's like, I mean, there's some merit, I suppose, in like talking about like digital archives, but I feel like there should still be a physical archive available for people to access, really. So, Nari. Can I say something here? Um, research has shown that when you digitise things, people will still want to come into the archive or the library or go to the museum and actually look at the object. Because when you digitise something, you will enhance it for that digital access. So you will brighten it up. You, um, a dark oil painting, for example, or um, where there has been writing in the old, um, really thin onion paper and the ink has went right through, you can sharpen that. And so people then might sort of think, oh, well, I would really like to come in and look at that. And then when they look at it, they actually see that it's not what it was digitally. Um, so yeah, people will have that, it's there, 
but they still actually want to look at it. They want to, if they can, if they're in the archives, like, you know, touch it. Some people want to smell things, you know. So I think um, making things digitally available will not take away people's desire to actually look, feel, touch, read um, in person. So I don't think it will ever replace the actual physical items. Richard? Yeah, I think, I mean, we don't really see the, dis because obviously these days, I mean, none of us as people would actually write letters anymore. I mean, there's no, we don't have paper archives anymore. So, I mean, we're pretty agnostic about it in the sense that what we think our primary aim or, you know, the thing we need to do is to provide access to these digital archives. And so we are increasingly getting hard disk of people's hard disks, of emails and whatever. Um, so our challenge is how you preserve that into the future. I mean, ironically, it's much easier to preserve a book than it is a digital file. And, um, you know, should someone doing Julia Horne's emails in 2100 be looking at it on its Gmail circa 2020? Or will our preservation techniques mean they'll be looking at it in some other completely different format, which in a way is a physical kind of manifestation of it. So, that, that, I mean, we spend increasingly, this library probably spends three or about $500,000, $600,000 a year on digital storage because we keep things in triplicate so that, but you know, it's vi it vastly, it is becoming expensive, but it's also um, just what we now collect. Uh, there are challenges making it accessible because rights are harder to manage. Um, do you access it in the reading room? Or if it's digital, why can't you access it at home and um, on your computer at home? So that, it's throwing up all sorts of interesting questions. We do find that people love coming in and they do like seeing original things. And the original is almost more valuable because they've observed it on the screen and you, you know, you show it to them, is that the real thing? And they can't quite believe that behind the digital is actually a real thing. But um, I think it's just, you know, in, in 50, 20 years' time, probably most of what we're collecting will be digital, and that's just the archive. And we'll be dealing with a hybrid kind of model of yeah. people who will well, be can, digital. And, yeah. Richard, I can assure you that my emails are not worthwhile collecting, so <laughs> you're safe there. But if we, uh, we're just running out of time, so we're about to run out of time, and I'd like to uh, give Jen the last word. So as, as the manager of digital collections, what's your response to that, just briefly? Uh, so look, my team is currently digitising a 130-foot Taurus scroll. That is never going to be appreciated in digital as it would um, in person. Uh, in saying that digital collections open up a collection, they increase access to it, they enable someone who can't afford to travel to Australia to be able to access it. Digital collections are incredibly important because so many things are digital now. Um, but while there's still physical things in the world, there's going to be physical archives and they're just as important. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that, uh, those words of wisdom at the end. <laughs> uh, look, thank you to my guests today. And as always, thank you to our appreciative audience. Um, this last six months has really been a great journey, both for Matthew, Thomas, my co-convener and myself, as we turned History of University Life, which has been going for about 10 years or so, into a webinar. Um, so. What I'm saying is that that brings us to the end, not only of this seminar, but also to the end of this special history of University Life 2020 series. We do hope to be back in one form or another, depending on the government, I guess, in 2021. But in the meantime, thank you for your support and also the best of end of year greetings to you all. Thank you. <laughs>